What's going on everybody? My name is Adam. Thanks so much for tuning in to our series called Wonder Life. Wonder Life is all about discovering who you are and why you're here. So let's dive in and discover the joy in being the you that God has made you to be. encourage you to get a note card out. There's a gray note card on the seat back in front of you. Or if you're a digital kind of person and you like to take notes digitally, get your smartphone out. Download the LifePoint app if you haven't done that already. You'll find a notes tab down there and you can follow along. But today's kind of message, you're going to want to take some good notes because there's homework that goes along with it. So I don't want you to miss out on any of that stuff. This Wonder Life series has been fun. I don't know if you guys have enjoyed it, but I sure have. And I love talking about the fact that God created every single one of us on purpose for a purpose. But discovering that purpose isn't always the easiest thing to do. And so we're about figuring that out. This is a not so perfect guide to figuring out who we are, why we're here, what in the world God wants to do in and through us. And today I wanna to talk about how there is, there's purpose in your passions. So I've titled this message, Why Do I Care? Why do I care? So you can write that down, why do I care? Have you noticed that in life people care about crazy things? Like there are things that you care about that I don't care about. And there are things that I care about that you don't care about. Have you ever had somebody try to get you to care about the things they care about? Like I was at a coffee shop one day and I had my headphones on, which is the international sign of don't bother me. You, know, you do that too, don't you? You go there, you put your earbuds in, you don't even look up. Well, that's where I was. I was kind of in study mode, and this woman clearly was not picking up on my hints. And so she plopped down next to me, looked like she wanted to talk to me. So I popped the you know, headphone off, and she proceeded for about 45 minutes to go on and on about how I need to be, have my eyes open to conspiracies and conspiracy theories. And she went on and on and on. And I wanted so bad to be like, why do I care? I don't, and, but, but I'm a pastor, so I smiled and nodded and pretended like I cared. I wish I just told her I didn't. I didn't know I was signing up for 45 minutes of who gives a rip, but that's where I was. You've been there, right? You ever had that? Somebody shows up at your house, and you don't even want, you're like looking through the blinds. You're like, oh, who is, I don't know. They're dressed up. They got a tie on. Don't open it. You've been there. Someone's trying to convince you, and you're like, why do I, why do I care? Why do I care? Why do I care? That doesn't, doesn't, you know, doesn't do anything to me. I don't really care. Or, or maybe you're the one that is highly passionate about something and you've tried to get other people to get on board and they're looking at you and they're like, I don't care about that. You know, I remember when we started LifePoint Church 10 years ago and I was like, man, everybody in Wilmington is going to love that we're starting a church. Guys, you need to come check out LifePoint. It's the greatest thing. It's going to change your life. And people would just look at me like, why do I care? Which made me start going, why do I care so much? So it seems like people don't care. Why, why, why do I care? Why do I care so much? Chances are there are things in this life that you care greatly about that you're like, I don't know why I care so much about this. It seems like other people don't care because it is true that there's things you care about that I don't care about and there's things I care about that you don't care about. And I want to tell you there is a reason for all of that and that God has an incredible way of using the passions of our life to point us towards the purpose that he created us for. We're, we're working through a book called Wonder Life, and I love this thing. It's like an adult coloring book with cool sayings in there, and it gives us some stuff to think about. And there's a page in there. I want to show this to you. It says this. 
It says, I'm unashamed about what I love and care about. I am unashamed about what I love and care about. And then in the fine print, it says, I will no longer diminish or downplay my passions for the sake of others' approval. I'm no longer going to diminish it. I'm no longer going to downplay it. You know, one of the biggest challenges that I see today for our students, for myself included, and I really, if you're in middle school or high school, I want you to tune in to what I'm about to tell you. One of the biggest challenges I see today is the fact that so many people are spending so much energy, so much money, just simply trying to blend in. Just trying to like, I don't want to stand out. I just want to fly under the radar. I don't want to be any different than anybody else. I just want to work so hard to just be like the crowd. But I want to tell you that when God created you, he never created you to blend in. He created you to stand out. You are different. And that's a good thing. But I see so many folks that are just trying so hard to just simply fly under the radar. And so what happens is we begin, to, we begin to suppress the things that we're passionate about because we're afraid, what if nobody else is passionate about it? What if nobody else cares about it? What if people start hating on the things that I like? I mean, how many know haters going to hate, right? Touch your neighbor and say, haters going to hate. It's what they do. Let them hate. You accept that God created you to be different, and he created you to stand out. The Bible tells us to refuse conformity. It says, do not conform to the patterns of this world, but be transformed. You were not designed to be just a carbon copy of everybody else. Quit looking to everybody else to figure out who you are and what you're going to be passionate about. You decide that I'm going to be transformed, and I'm going to let God do what he wants to do in me and through me. And here's why. I want you to get this. You can jot this down. Listen, you will never discover your purpose pretending to be someone else. You will never discover your purpose pretending to be someone else. Touch your neighbor, just poke him on the shoulder, say he's talking to you. Tell him, you've been wanting to say that. He's talking to you. I'm talking to all of you. I'm talking to myself included. We'll never discover why God put us here. As long as we're pretending, and there's a lot of us that are pretending. I did it when I was a kid, pretending, because I didn't want to stand out. I was afraid if, I, if I'm really outspoken about the things I care about, I'm going to look different, and people might make fun of me, and I don't want to do that. And so I just pretended, but I'll never discover my purpose pretending to be someone else. You ever heard people say this? Just be yourself. Just be yourself. Somebody say it. Say, be yourself. Have you learned that being yourself is much easier said than done? I mean, being yourself is one of the scariest and most difficult things. A little while back, I was on a trip, and I had made new friends with a pastor, and he pastors a pretty large church, and we were getting to know each other, and he says to me, he says, so let me ask you a question. He says, what kind of preacher are you? And he wasn't saying that like he couldn't figure it out, but like we, he hadn't heard me preach, but he was curious. He's like, what kind of preacher are you? And it made me kind of stop and go, I don't know. What kind of preacher am I? You know, I, I, like to, I like to preach. I like to get excited. I like to get riled up, but I'm not like hellfire and brimstone and beat people over the head with the word of God. That's not really me. But I stand firmly on truth, and I believe the Bible is the inerrant word of God, and I love to get it fired up, but not all the time. But I like to teach as well. I like to use this fancy screen and touch it and tell words and get people to participate. I'm like, so am I a teacher? I don't know. Am I a preacher? I don't know. I don't know what I am. But it reminded me of the early days starting LifePoint Church. If you've been around for 10 years, you, you've seen some pretty interesting transformations. When I started this church, I wanted to be anything but myself. I wanted to be every successful pastor that was out there. So I literally felt like before I stepped on stage, like I put on a costume, like I got into character and I tried to be someone else. And the reason for that was because I know me. And I know what I'm good at, and I know what I'm not good at. And I knew back then I was 29. I mean, I'm about to be 40. Is that crazy? Remember when you used to think 30 was old? And then you thought 40 was old? I don't know if you know this, but 40 is the new 20. I mean, it's like so young, so young. Amen. So I'm thinking, like, I mean, I'm 29. What do I know? So I've got to pretend like I know, and I've got to pretend to be these other people. And I tried, and it was exhausting. And it took, it took kind of coming to grips with the fact that if God is sovereign, meaning if God is 
If God is all-knowing and God is all-powerful, I mean, church, do you believe that? Do you believe that God is all-knowing and God is all-powerful? Nod your head if you do. You do, okay? A lot of us do. Some of you are like, I'm not so sure. That's cool. As Christians, we believe that God is all-knowing. He's all-powerful. We also believe that God created us on purpose. I mean, do you believe that you, you were created on purpose? Yeah, yeah. We've been talking about that for several weeks. So it took, it took a while for me to come to this place of understanding that an all-knowing God created me on purpose. And this all-knowing God called me to start a church in Wilmington at this time to reach a unique group of people. So this all-knowing God knows how I'm wired, my quirks, my weirdness, and all of that. He must know that there are quirky, weird people in this city that will connect with a quirky, weird pastor so long as that pastor is willing to be himself. Can, can, see, see, it's one thing when a room full of people are amening. It's another when you're at home going, I don't know if anybody's going to show up. Like, if I'm me, I don't even know if I want to be there. And so I just remember wrestling through the challenge. I remember thinking, like, God, do you know what you're doing? I'm inexperienced. I mean, I know me. I drink way too much coffee. I'm way too caffeinated. I've never done this before. I'm not a detailed person. I love to start things. Not sure about finishing things. Like, I don't have a lot of time. I'm married. I got three young kids. They need a lot of my time. And so I just remember going through all these things about what I'm good at and what I'm not good at, God. I'm not the most detailed. I'm not the most disciplined. I battle insecurity sometimes. I'm not very good mechanically. I'm not the most macho guy out there. I mean, like, I, you don't want me working on anything of yours. That's what I'm saying. <laughs> Like the other day, we were sitting out, I, had a, I was in one of the guy's offices here, and uh, several of our staff guys, I'm not going to rat them out, and however, we've got some construction going on around the building, and this one of the construction guys sticks his head in, and I mean, we're talking like, you know, rough, big bearded guy, and he sticks his head in and goes, hey, you know if we got any conduit around here? And I was, I looked at the other guys, I was like, man, I'm not really sure what size you need. <laughs> he rattled off something like a half inch, three quarter inch. I looked at the guys, I'm now, I don't know about that, Sarah, but I'll try to find an answer for you. He walked off and looked at the guys I'm like, what in the world is conduit? I was like, I have no idea. What is, if you need help, I can do it. I was like, what? I don't know. That's all I got. I don't know. I don't know. It's weird. And I remember thinking, like, God, you know all of this, and yet you called me to start this church. And if I pretend to be somebody that I'm not, we're not going to reach the people that you are calling us here to reach because they're only going to connect with the person that you've called to come and do that. Listen, basically, God had to kind of take me on a journey to discover that I'll never, I'll never discover my purpose pretending to be someone else, pretending to be someone else. So I want to tell you this. You be you. You be you. Turn to your neighbor and say, you be you. Tell them right now, you be you, because you can't be me. You can't. There is only one me. You can't be me. So let's talk about David. Let's talk about David. Every week of this series, we've been looking at this guy named David, and David's a phenomenal guy. We've been learning a little bit about him, still tons to learn, but think about what we know about David so far. We've been studying his life. We've been shotgunning around. We know that David is the youngest of a bunch of brothers. How many brothers did he have? Anybody remember? He's got seven brothers. So there's eight of them. He's the youngest. Run of the litter, youngest brother. Now, we also know that as a kid, he had, you know, responsibilities. His responsibilities were what? What was his kind of, what did he do when he was a kid? He was a Shepherd, yes, yeah, spent his days out in the field watching sheep where he developed some pretty interesting talents. What are some of his talents? Shout it if you know it. Play the harp. Yeah, as a mean harpist, mean harp player. The harp or the lyre, the Bible kind of goes between the two words. So a musician, he wrote poetry. But what else did he do? He was pretty good with a sling. He was good with a sling, like throw a stone in there and pow, you know. If lions and tigers and bears, oh my, came after the sheep, he took them down. We know that about him. We know that he made some pretty huge mistakes in life, didn't he? We also know that God had a very specific purpose in his life. We know he had these interests and these passions, and they helped bring about his purpose. I often wonder if David ever found himself going, God, what are you going to do with me? I'm so quirky. I wonder if he ever stopped and thought, like, God, so uh, I'm pretty good at writing songs. I play a mean harp. I am, I am like, great with a sling. I've got incredible accuracy with a sling. I'm pretty good at keeping tabs on these sheep. I don't know what you could ever do with that, God, but this is me. This is my skills and my passions and my interests. You can have it. Do with it what you want. I wonder if you ever had that conversation with God, because when you begin to look at the life of David, you begin to see these things come about. Like, check this out. So when David was on his way to, to, you know, watching sheep and sort of getting to the place that God had for him, there was a king in place. 
The king's name was Saul. And Saul was the first king of Israel. Saul started off as a godly king, but over time he began to ignore the Lord's instructions. And, and by doing that, the spirit of the Lord departed from him. And we're told that an evil spirit began to torment him. And he just began to have anxiety and he began to, to be distressed. And one of his servants said, listen, when I'm going through difficult times, this is what's helpful to me. Maybe this is helpful for you. Let me make a suggestion. Why don't you find somebody that can play a harp? And when you're going through these distressing times and these tormenting times, he'll play for you and the music will soothe you. I mean, there's nothing like a good playlist, am I right? Sometimes you just got to put on your, your playlist and just kind of chill for a bit. And that's his suggestion. Well, take a look at this. In 1 Samuel 16, Saul says to his attendants, he says, okay, find someone who plays well and bring him to me. So get somebody that can play the harp, bring him to me. One of the servants answered, I've seen a son of Jesse of what? Uh, you said Bethlehem. We learned week one, it is pronounced Bethlehem. Bethlehem. On three. Let's all say Bethlehem. One, two, three. Bethlehem. That's how they say it over there in Israel, but you can get by with Bethlehem. I just didn't want you to forget. So Bethlehem's tiny little town. Hey, I've seen a guy. I know a guy. He's pretty good with a harp. He's in this tiny little town. He knows how to play the lyre or the harp. He's a brave man and a warrior. He speaks well and is fine looking man. And the Lord is with him. What are the odds of some random younger brother in Bethlehem who is a shepherd getting the invitation to go and begin to work in the palace for the king? This is pretty remarkable. I mean, I wonder if he ever was like, Mom, why do I got to take harp lessons? Why do I, I'm never going to use this. And all of a sudden, one of his interests and abilities begins to put him in a position to serve in the palace that he will eventually be the king of. You got to admit, that's pretty crazy. And then what about this? What about the fact that he was really good with a sling? And one day, his father would send him on an assignment to go deliver some cheese and bread to his brothers at the front lines of battle. And when he arrived there, he saw the army of the Philistines on one hill and the Israelites on the other, and this giant of a man come walking out taunting talking smack about Israel, talking smack about God, then David's like, why aren't you guys doing anything about this? And all of a sudden, they had this moment where David begins to look at this. He's like, I could, I could take this guy down. I could take him down. And his inquiry takes him before the king. And take a look at this. David is standing there in front of the king, and he says to Saul, your servant, talking about himself, has been keeping his father's sheep. When a lion or a bear came and carried off a sheep from the flock, I went after it struck it down and rescued the sheep from its mouth. I mean, Dave is a bad dude. Can we all agree? Because, I mean, if I'm out watching sheep and a bear comes and gets one, I'm like, you can have that. <laughs> First one's on me. You're welcome. <laughs> Not David. David's like, oh, no, you didn't. And he says, so he goes after it, strikes it down, rescues the sheep from its mouth. Then he says, when it turned on me, I cried like a little girl, wet myself, ran away. That's what I would have said. He says, it turned on me. So I was like, oh, no, you didn't. Uh, so I, I seized it by the hair, struck it, and killed it. He's, he's pretty bad. <laughs> then he says this. He says, your servant has killed both the lion and the bear, and this uncircumcised Philistine will be like one of them because he has defied the armies of the living God. And then the Lord, who, he says, the Lord who rescued me from the paw of the lion, paw of the bear, will rescue me from the hand of this Philistine. And Saul said to David, Go. And the Lord be with you. Well, check this out. So David shows up to the battlefield, and Goliath is looking at him. And we're told that as the Philistine moved closer to attack him, David ran quickly toward the battle line to meet him. Reaching into his bag, taking out a stone, he slung it and struck the Philistine on the forehead, and the stone sank into his forehead, and he fell face down on the ground. So David triumphed over the Philistine with a sling and a stone without a sword in his hand. He struck down the Philistine and killed him. Pretty awesome that what David was doing in the pasture, he ended up using on the battlefield. And the story doesn't stop there. What's so cool is he ends up walking up to Goliath and he draws Goliath's sword out of the sheath and he begins to cut off Goliath's head. And then he begins to just walk around with it in his hand. Some of you are like, that's in the Bible? That is in the Bible. The Bible's awesome. I, that's why I, I think that's why I, I love violent movies, because these are the stories I like. These are, I mean, literally, he walked around like a trophy with it in his hands. That's cool. I got a friend who has a tattoo of this, David holding the head of Goliath. I'm like, that is awesome. Love that. But how cool. How cool that what 
that what David did every day, ordinary day, these talents and abilities he possessed actually were used by God to put him in a position to take the next step that he had in life. Think about this. Fast forward in David's life, and he's a fugitive. He's on the run. I mean, he's running for his life. And as a fugitive, he seems to attract this ragtag bunch of people, 400 men, begin following him, and they look to him as a leader. And he's got to figure, how do I lead 400 of these, you know, just roughneck people? And he relies on his training as a shepherd to lead these guys. I find it fascinating to think that God used the pasture to prepare David for what he had ahead of him. And, and what I want to tell you is there's a lot of things in your life right now that you're tempted to overlook that God is using to prepare you for the purpose that he has for you. It's almost as if when David was in the pasture, God was putting things in him that he was going to draw out of him later in life. I wonder what God is putting in you today that he's going to draw out of you down the road. And if you pretend to be somebody you are not, you will not have anything to draw from because you resisted what God wanted to put in you. Let me ask, what's in you? What's in you I want to give you three questions to ask, and we're going, to, we're going to move quickly through these three questions. I want you to write this down. This is your homework. Your homework is to sometime today, early this week, to ask these questions, because I think these questions are going to, they're going to give some clarity to who you are, why you're here. So let me give you these three questions. First one is this. What interests me? What interests me? Second one, what am I good at? Third one, what burdens me? What interests me? What am I good at? What burdens me? Write these down. What interests me? What am I good at? What burdens me? Let's talk about this first one. What interests me? Have you ever stopped to think about the things that interest you? So these three questions, we as a family, we were sitting down for dinner the other night, and I knew I was going to be preaching on this today, and I thought, well, this would be some good dinner time conversation. And so I told our kids, I said, here's kind of what I'm preaching this weekend, and I love to ask you guys these questions, and let's talk about it. And it was neat to have this dialogue, and I said, question number one is this, what interests you? And I said, you need to answer this for yourself. And we started going around the table, talking about things that we're interested in, things that, that we find interesting. Now, here's the deal. When I'm asking what interests me, the only person that should answer this is me. So when I say to you what interests you, don't ask anybody else what your interests are. Nobody else can tell you what is of interest to you but you. So the best person to ask is yourself. And here's what happens. So often we ignore our interests, and I want to tell you that our interests are an incredible indicator of our purpose. So what interests you? What interests you? What are the things that you're into? And it may change. It's okay for them to change. My interests are very seasonal. I find new hobbies all the time. My wife can't stand this. There's always something new I'm into, something I want to buy. And here's what happens. Oftentimes we ignore our interests or we're embarrassed by our interests. We're embarrassed that we're interested in certain things because we're afraid other people won't be interested in them. So instead of letting people know what we're interested in, we just pretend to be interested in what everybody else is. You have been given interest. There are things you're into that other people aren't into. You need to be okay with that. For instance, it took me a long time to accept the fact that I have a passion for fashion. I said it. I know it's not the manliest thing to say. I don't care. I like jeans. I can talk to you about jeans. Designer jeans, raw jeans, selvage denim jeans, 11.75 ounce denim, 16 ounce denim, cone mills. What do you want to know? I like jeans. I'm okay with that. I'm okay with that. Some of you were like, did he, j yes. I'm all right with that. I'm interested in him, okay? There, it's out there. But what else? What else? You know, because here's what happens. Somebody sitting here is like, well, I like jeans too. We're going to be jean friends. It's great. <laughs> when you're honest about your interests, other people will be drawn to you. It's amazing. It's, it's the reason we do small groups the way we do small groups here at LifePoint. We take your interests and your passions and we, we tell people, hey, if you like, I mean, this is crazy, but some people like to run. That's sick. And so other people that have a sickness called running can run with you. And you can, whatever you do, like, you can do that together and you can build uh, friendships. We have people that love, like, you know, riding motorcycles. That's a great one. I, a while back, I developed an interest for Jeeps. I bought a 93 Jeep YJ, and it's amazing the way other people with Jeeps come together. Jeep people got to stay together because we break down a lot. And we need each other. <laughs> we need each other to fix our, our Jeeps, especially if you're like me. And so it's interesting when you start looking at these interests the way other people come together. 
I also really like shoes. I know that goes with the fashion thing, but I, I, like, I like Air Jordans, like retro ones and threes and, well, I could go a bunch of them, but I like, I, I like these. And here, so here's what's funny is I've had people that will come up to me in the lobby and I'm thinking they're going to want to tell me how awesome that message was. And they're like, man, dude, I dig those shoes. <laughs> For real? And I'll have mothers who are like, my teenager, I don't think he listened to a thing you said, but he really liked your shoes. What? I had a guy say, can we have a small group that, that like talks about shoes? <laughs> Why not? But the interesting thing are the friendships that I've formed just around these things. Like I, I also, I'm, I dig CrossFit. I mean, you know how if somebody's into CrossFit, they talk about CrossFit all the time. That's what we do. And what's interesting is how friends of mine from CrossFit have started coming to church and friends of mine from church have started coming to CrossFit. Just, it's just an interest. Just amazing to me how God can use things that I'm interested in. I had a guy come up to me in the lobby. He said, he said, would you see if there's anybody that's into spear fishing? So I'm just lobbing that out there. If you are, message me. I'll get you connected. We got scuba diving, spear fishing people. Like, how cool is that? God will use your interests to attract people. What interests me? You have to ask yourself. Don't ask anybody else. Question number one, what interests me? Question number two, what am I good at? What am I good at? Now, the, only, the best people to ask here, because here's what happens. A lot of times we downplay our giftings and our talents. We're like, man, I can't do nothing right. I don't have any skills. I don't have any, any abilities, any talents. You know, there's no skills. So if you need to find people that, that are close to you, you need to ask others. So we sat down at the table, and I said, you can't answer this for yourself. I want other people to speak about the things that you're good at. And so it was cool to see, you know, my son saying this about my daughter, my daughter saying this about my son, just talking about things that they're good at. You have talents and abilities that are unique to you. They're unique to you. And so don't downplay that. You know, early on in life, we discovered that I have the gift of gab. I could talk to anybody about anything. How interesting that God has given me an opportunity to use my big mouth to preach the gospel. If we ignored the talents and giftings that God's given me, I would have tried to, I mean, I, I wanted to pursue something else. And yet God's allowed me to use the talents and the abilities. And so when I look around our church, there's so many different talents and abilities. There are people in this church with the gift of writing. I mean, you are wordsmith. The way you just, you can craft sentences and you write books and it's amazing. It's incredible. And then we've got people that are very mechanical in nature. You understand how things work and you fix things and you're good at that. Then there's those that are like incredibly organized. And I usually make fun of type A people, but truth is, truth is we need you. We need you. And, and your gift of organization is there for a reason. Then there's those that are good at building things and construction related. Like you build something and it doesn't fall apart. That's a talent right there. You know, coaching other people. You're good at calling out potential in people. We've got a, uh, we've, we've got a lady on staff, incredibly gifted. Well, Lenise, I'll point to her right there. She is phenomenal at design. Like, I could, I, you gave me, like, five pieces of furniture, and it will look horrible when I set it up. She'll walk in and move things around, and I'm like, yeah, perfect. Like, it's a, that's a talent that I don't possess. She's incredible. And so what you realize is your talents are different than my talents. And we need to begin to be confident in the talents that we have. David's talents put him in a position to take the next step towards fulfilling the purpose that God had for his life. What are you good at? You need to ask others. Ask other people over lunch. Ask other people. Third question is this. What burdens me? What burdens me? What is that thing on your heart that, that you can't seem to shake? What is it? The best place to go and the best person to ask is God himself. God, what are you burdening my heart for? I notice that, that we carry burdens for things. Now, maybe you're here and you're like, there's not really anything that burdens me. I promise you, if you begin to say, God, put a burden on my heart that I can invest my life in, you'll be amazed at what God will do. So like, for instance, our Nicaragua team, why in the world did they spend over $1,000 and take a week off work to go and serve people in a village that they may never see again? Why would they do that? Well, it's because God put a burden there. None of them were sitting around going, man, I, what should I do with this extra 1000 bucks? Nobody was like, well, hey, I got extra vacation days. I should just spend it digging ditches. No, they were like, there's a burden on my heart, and I don't know why, and I'm going to move towards that. I'm going to use my talents and my interests and my passion to do this. What do you feel compelled to do that other people don't even seem to notice? And it bugs you. And you're like, somebody needs to do something about this. Listen, don't ignore your interests. Don't downplay your giftings, and don't pawn off your burdens on other people. So often I, feel, I find people that they're burdened about something. They're like, Pastor Jeff, I got this incredible burden. The church needs to do something about this. And I say, wait a second, God put that burden on you so that you could do something about it. 
And I want to tell you, God has put burdens on each of us. There's something that burdens us that we are called to do. Don't pass it off. Don't pass it off. I love when I was going through Facebook this past week, uh, Sandy Norris, who is a phenomenal part of our church. If you know Sandy, she absolutely rocks. If you don't know Sandy, you need to get to know her. She wrote this. She wrote, I am unashamed about what I love and care about. Hashtag wonder life. Then she said, I hope you are too. And she wrote this. She said, here's my thing. That's her words, not mine. She says, I am passionate about ending hunger in my community, especially for children. I stay awake at night thinking about how to help. They are too often the victim of traumatic, unexpected circumstances or poor choices made by the adults who they rely on for basic human needs. I do not apologize for blowing up my Facebook feed with articles and posters about ways we can all help. And I am, gi- and I am just naive enough to believe that if I grow extra food to share with those who are hungry, then I've made a difference. And then she quotes the a great theologian, Lil Wayne, she says, find your thing and do you. <laughs> Turn to your neighbor and say, do you. do you. I love Sandy. I love her passion. I love her enthusiasm. But she says, this is my burden, and I'm going to do what I can. I'm going to do what I can. I like what Romans chapter 12 says. This is in the message paraphrase. I just like the verbiage of this. It says, here's what I want you to do. God helping you. Take your everyday, ordinary life, your sleeping, eating, going to work, and walking around life, and place it before God as an offering. God, here's my interest, here's my talents, here's my burden. I'm just giving it to you. If you can use it, you're welcome to it. And then it goes on and says, embracing what God does for you is the best thing you can do for him. Don't become so well-adjusted to your culture that you fit into it without even thinking. Instead, fix your attention on God, and you'll be changed from the what? From the inside out. It's amazing how God will use what is in us to bring about what he is calling us to do. There is purpose behind our passions. I found God does amazing things in our lives when we give him an all access pass to our passions. God, here's all of me. If you can use it, you're welcome to it. And let me just tell you, I don't know what God will do in your life. I'm not promising you fame. It's not about being famous. It's about being faithful. It's about hearing the words, well done, good and faithful servant. It's about knowing that the very things that you are interested in and passionate about and gifted to do have been done. And at the end of your days, you can look back and say, God, I poured myself out. I spent my life on something greater. I like the, uh, all the guys that went to Nicaragua had a t-shirt. They got a t-shirt and on the back of the t-shirt is this quote by Howard Thurman. And it says, don't ask yourself what the world needs. Ask yourself what makes you come alive and go do that. Because what the world needs is people who have come alive. When you allow God all access to the passions and giftings in your life, you're gonna see him do more in you and through you than you could ever imagine possible. It's amazing what God can do through a life that isn't looking for fame, isn't looking to fit in or just blend in or be like everybody else, but willing to be unique willing to live out the passions and giftings that God has put inside of you. And I want to be a part of a church that does just that. Would you pray with me?